Good afternoon. Welcome to the Foreign Press Center. We're very pleased to have you with us today. My name is Mark Zimmer. I'm a media relations officer here. Uh, the presentation today is a preview of the visit of the Republic of Korea President Park. We're very pleased to have with us National Security Council Senior Director for Asian Affairs Daniel Crittenbrink, Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs Daniel Russell, and United States Ambassador to the Republic of Korea Mark Lippert. Each of them will make an opening statement and then we'll open it up for questions. We have approximately uh, one hour. Uh, thank you again for joining us, Mr. Crittenbrink. Great. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's great to see you all again. It's great to be back here at the Foreign Press Center. Oh, no, Excuse me? Not you. Go ahead. Okay. Thanks. Uh, uh, at any rate, it's great to be back here at the Foreign Press Center, and I'm particularly honored to be here to speak with you today about President Pakane's October 16 <coughs> official working visit to Washington, D.C. I'm also honored to be joined here today by two of America's finest diplomats, uh, Assistant Secretary Danny Russell and Ambassador Mark Lippert. So our plan today is for me to give you a brief overview of President Pak's visit to talk about the schedule and some of the general themes and our goals. I'll then ask Assistant Secretary Russell to provide a sense of how our alliance with the ROK fits into our broader regional and global strategy. And then Ambassador Lippert uh, will provide an on-the-ground uh, perspective of our alliance and explain some of the new frontier issues. Then we'll move to uh, Q's and A's. So first a bit on President Pak's schedule. President Park arrived yesterday, uh, late yesterday afternoon, October 13. Uh, I was honored to be one of the officials out at Joint Base Andrews to greet her. Um, uh, we're very excited that President Park will have a robust schedule of engagements uh, both today uh, and tomorrow, Friday, including a lunch uh, tomorrow hosted by the Vice President at his residence. And uh, I understand that President Park is the first Asian leader that the Vice President has hosted at the Naval Observatory this year. President Obama will host President Park at the White House on October 16, and her White House program will consist of a bilateral meeting in the Oval Office, followed by a working lunch, and then a press conference in the East Room. So uh, having gone through the schedule, I just want to provide a few general comments on how we view the visit. First, to put the visit in context, this is the fourth major visit to the White House by an Asian leader in 2015. President Obama received Japanese Prime Minister Abe in April. Vietnamese General Secretary Chom in July, and of course Chinese President Xi just a few weeks ago in September. And later this month we'll welcome Indonesian President Widodo. This is a sign that our rebalance to the Asia Pacific is alive and well. And of course we've had a very intensive engagement with the Republic of Korea as well. We've been very much looking forward to President Park's visit for some time. As you know, earlier this year President uh, Park was forced to postpone her visit originally uh, scheduled for June because of the outbreak of MERS in Korea. We certainly understood the reasons for uh, the postponement and we're delighted that we've been able to reschedule the visit for this year. The President eagerly looks forward to welcoming President Park back to the White House on Friday. It's of course not her first time there. President Obama was honored when President Park made Washington her first foreign destination after taking office in 2013. Her visit at that, at that time was historic as we celebrated the 60th anniversary of our alliance. <coughs> Since then, President Obama has met with President Park during his visit to Seoul in April 2014, and our two presidents have had a number of meetings on the sidelines of multilateral meetings around the globe. This coupled with the fact that President Obama has visited Korea more times than any other Asian country during his presidency is an excellent indicator of just how much the president values the U.S.-ROK alliance. It's often been said that our alliance and partnership has never been stronger, and I can say with confidence today that's an absolutely true statement. Um, just a few comments on our goals uh, for the visit. Um, I think during uh, the, meeting, uh, the meetings and the working lunch on Friday, we'll seek to enhance our already robust alliance uh, cooperation through discussion of what we call foundational issues. Chief among those, of course, is the U.S. ROC military alliance, which in its sec 62nd year is stronger than ever. Our commitment to the defense of the Republic of Korea remains unwavering. Goes without saying that our open societies and commitment to democracy and a market economy provide the solid foundations of our alliance and our deep friendship with the South Korean people, which was formed, forged in the crucible of war. We'll highlight the work we've done over the past year to enhance capabilities and make additional investments in our armed forces that ensures it continues to grow in strength. And we'll of course seek to coordinate closely on issues of mutual interest and concern. North Korea, of course, will be at the top of the agenda. We'll reaffirm our commitment to the complete, verifiable denuclearization of the DPRK 
we'll discuss ways to bring North Korea back to serious and meaningful denuclearization talks. We'll call on North Korea to abide by its obligations and commitments on its seven, September 2015 joint statement of the six-party talks. And we'll also call on North Korea not to take any actions that violate UN Security Council resolutions or escalate tensions. President Obama will be e eager to hear from President Park on the latest on inter-Korean developments and express support for President Park's efforts to improve South-North relations. Also among these foundational issues that we'll discuss is our dy dynamic economic and trade relationship, which we also seek to deepen and strengthen during President Park's visit. Beyond our cooperation on North Korea, we'll also seek to further expand our dynamic global partnership. Over the past year, we forged, uh, we have worked together to counter the menace of ISIL, provided humanitarian assistance to Syrian refugees and to the Ukrainian people. We have plans to do even more together around the world. And finally, we'll seek to set the course for the future of our relationship through cooperation on a range of new issues uh, that we call new frontier issues, uh, including matters of increasing importance in the 21st century, such as global health, cybersecurity, climate change, energy, space cooperation. And I will ask Ambassador Lippert to expand on those issues uh, in just a moment. And of course, we'll seek ways to highlight the longstanding important and growing ties between our two peoples. So with that, I'll end my opening remarks here, and I'd now like to turn to my colleague and good friend, Assistant Secretary Russell, uh, to dis discuss how the Republic of Korea fits into our broader regional uh, and global uh, uh, strategy. Dean? Thanks very much, Dan. Uh, let me start by offering a little bit of context and a little bit of history. I talk a lot about the rebalance, and I'm uh, accustomed now to hear uh, from others that they think that the U.S. rebalance policy began with President Obama's 2011 speech to the Australian uh, Parliament in Canberra. But the fact of the matter is that's not true. The rebalance started the day that President Obama took office in January 20th, 2009. And if you don't believe me, ask Ambassador Lippert. He was not only there, he was running the NSC and much of uh, the White House at the beginning of the administration. In the first six months of the administration in 2009, President Obama hosted three key Asian allies in the Oval Office, uh, the Prime Minister of Japan, uh, the Prime Minister of uh, Australia in February and March, respectively, uh, and then uh, the then President of the Republic of Korea. The ROK was and is front and center in America's rebalance to the Asia-Pacific region. Fast forward past the President's visit to Seoul later in 2009, past the three visits, uh, three additional visits that he's made to Korea since then, uh, to President, former President Lee's state visit here in 2011, or President Park's own visit here in 2013, uh, Vice President Biden's uh, multiple visits to Korea, or the many meetings that uh, the U.S. and the ROK presidents have had on the margins of multilateral meetings, including, importantly, uh, the trilateral summit that President Obama hosted in the Hague and, of course, many other uh, trilateral meetings with Japan that have been hosted at ministerial level. Here we are now in 2015. And in 2015, in a span of just six months, the leaders of the three major Northeast Asian countries have visited or are about to visit Washington, D.C. to meet with President Obama. This is no accident. In addition uh, to the other uh, visitors from elsewhere in uh, Asia over the course of 2015, uh, President Obama, of course, will be meeting with President Park and other leaders at APEC, at the G20, at the East Asia Summit, uh, and I know that these uh, upcoming consultations with President Park create an opportunity to tighten our coordination. So what does all this mean, these visits in aggregate? Well, first it means that the rebalance is going strong. 
uh, that there is sustained U.S. engagement, sustained U.S. investment in the Asia-Pacific region and in the relationships with uh, the people, the nations, and the leaders of uh, the countries there. It also means that America's alliances, including and especially the U.S. ROK alliance, continue to provide important stability in a volatile world. These alliances maintain peace on a peninsula that's tragically divided and that's threatened by North Korea's proactive, uh, provocative behavior and its illicit nuclear and ballistic missile programs. This clearly, too, will be a focus of the discussions. I think it, it means also that uh, with the successful conclusion of the TPP, which knits together 40% of global GDP, uh, and was, I think, importantly helped by our success not only in negotiating the Chorus FTA, but in implementing the Chorus FTA, uh, that we have a framework for global growth and for uh, jobs throughout the region. I think it means, importantly, that uh, the United States has a network of immensely capable partners, uh, partners like the ROK in dealing with global issues and global challenges like climate, like cyber, like communicable disease, like proliferation, terrorism, humanitarian assistance or relief, uh, sustainable development. And lastly, I think it means that the strong bipartisan support and the strong public support, both in the United States and in the ROK, for our alliance and for the rebalance ensures that this region will remain an important American strategic priority and that the region can continue to count on the United States. Uh, lastly, I would just say that I know that it means a great deal that President Obama chose uh, a close friend and one of his closest and most trusted aides to, uh, to serve as his representative and as uh, America's ambassador to the Republic of Korea, Mark Lippert. Uh, thanks, Danny. Um, I, I really don't have much to add to what Dan and Danny said. They really covered the landscape well. I, I'm at the risk of being a little redundant. Let me just make a couple of very brief and quick points. First, uh, as Dan and Danny both alluded to, the relationship is incredibly strong. It's in very good shape. And in fact, I think one can make a credible case that it's, the alliance is in the best shape it's ever been. Uh, why do I say that? I, I use usually a three-pronged test. Uh, for this. First, uh, we are doing unbelievably complicated things together, uh, from Ebola in West Africa to the civil nuclear agreement to OPCON transition to deterring uh, North Korean provocation. These are hard, difficult things that we are doing together that are increasingly complex. Second, uh, we are doing them well. We are getting to good outcomes. We are getting to good policy outcomes uh, and good uh, public uh, affairs outcomes as well. Uh, we were able to contain Ebola in West Africa. We reached conclusion on the civil nuclear deal. We deterred North Korean provocation successfully, and we managed the OPCON uh, transition, I think, in a very smooth and successful manager manner. And even with uh, the fact that we're doing hard, complicated, difficult things together, as Danny mentioned, the alliance is incredibly popular. Um, and that's very important in democratic societies. That democratic foundation gives our governments, uh, gives our leaders uh, the credibility, the space to do even more uh, complex, difficult, and great things together. So that's, we're sort of in this virtuous cycle at this point in time, and that's a good thing. Um, just about the visit, just to uh, a little bit reiterate with what Dan said, I think three main objectives first. I think strengthening the interpersonal relations between the two leaders, which is already quite good, uh, and knowing the President, President Obama well and getting to know President Pak a little bit when I've been on the peninsula, 
especially when she came to visit me in the hospital, I, I can see why the two leaders uh, like each other uh, and get along well. Uh, they're both extremely substantive. Uh, they're both extremely uh, insightful. And I see why the personal chemistry works. Uh, and that has good trickle-down effects in every part of the relationship. A second, as Dan mentioned, we're going to have a robust discussion. I anticipate a robust discussion between the two leaders on the foundational issues, North Korea, the economy, uh, the global partnership. I won't belabor them here. Dan outlined them well, and Danny did as well. And finally, because the relationship is, is in such good shape, because it is maturing, because there is additional bandwidth, and because our two peoples strongly support the relationships, we are able to do new things. And I think what the presidents uh, feel that a very important outcome of the summit is to set the strategic direction of the relationship for the, the next five or 10 years. And that's adding on what we're calling, as Dan mentioned, the new frontiers, cyberspace, energy, uh, environment, and global health. And these are issues that are increasingly salient in the 21st century. They're bilateral, they're multilateral, they're global issues, they're cross-cutting issues. They're issues that both of our peoples have deep expertise on, so we can tap into the, the talents that are already on the peninsula. And finally, we've done some good work in many of these areas together that has uh, laid a good baseline. And the point is then, with the strategic vision of our two leaders, with the talents of our two peoples, uh, we are able to build the alliance uh, and keep it modern, dynamic, and innovative well into the 21st century. So I'll, I'll stop there uh, and uh, be prepared for, for questions. Thank you. We'll move into questions and answers now. Please uh, identify yourself and your outlet. Please keep your questions as brief as possible. If colleagues in New York have a question, they'll step to the podium and we'll address them. Let's start in the front, please. Please uh, identify if you're addressing a particular briefer. Thank you very much. Jamie Wong, the Khan Company. TV. I'm going to throw out a China question first. Um, is there any anxiety in this administration that you would like to hear from President Park to explain the closer tie between South Korea and China? If not, have you already um, reached a consensus or understanding on this subject? And secondly, are you going to persuade South Korea to come out and take a position on freedom of navigation and also conduct activities based on rule of laws, just as Australian and the U.S. did yesterday. Thank you. Thanks. Well, I'll begin by saying that the United States has long supported the improvement in relations between Seoul and Beijing. Um, and speaking personally, I'm proud that in my career back in the early 90s at the U.N., uh, I had a small hand in fostering the normalization of relations uh, between the ROK and China. But today, in the 21st century, in 2015, it's more important than ever that not only for economic reasons, but for strategic reasons as well, uh, the Republic of Korea and the People's Republic of China have a, uh, a robust uh, relationship and dialogue. The Republic of Korea is a strong democracy. The Republic of Korea is a free market economy. The Republic of Korea is a friend and an ally of the United States. We have no qualms, we have no trepidation about more contact and more high-level dialogue between our ally and friend and an important uh, neighbor and, a, frankly, an important uh, regional actor, China. Moreover, the visit by President Xi to Seoul, as I've said many times, uh, marked, I think, a historic turning point in terms of the prospects for the future of the Korean Peninsula. It is a good thing for the leaders of China to hear directly uh, from another uh, democratically, from a democratically elected uh, president in a neighboring uh, country. And given the span and scope of uh, the ROK's uh, interests, uh, in Northeast Asia and beyond, uh, it makes perfect sense for that relationship to flourish. With regard to uh, freedom of navigation, um, I cast my memory back to the uh, declaration by China of uh, an air defense identification zone in the East China Sea, uh, to which uh, the ROK responded uh, appropriately, vigorously, 
and in concert with international law. Freedom of navigation isn't an American issue. It's not a China issue. It's a global issue. It's not an American right or uh, Australian right. It's a universal right. And all nations, uh, and particularly all nations that are as dependent on uh, the sanctity of the sea lanes have an interest in protecting that. I think that's exceptionally well said, Dan. Could I just add maybe just two points? One, just to reinforce what Danny said quite eloquently. We, we do not see uh, these issues in zero-sum terms. We encourage all countries in the region to have a constructive relationship with China. As you know, we just uh, recently hosted President Xi Jinping here in Washington for a state visit. Um, and we, too, uh, pursue and have a constructive uh, relationship China, with China. Uh, yet it's a relationship that's quite complex as well. So uh, as Danny said, we encourage, whether it's the Republic of Korea or other friends uh, and allies or, or other partners in the region, we encourage them all to work to have constructive relations, uh, relations with China. And, and on the, the South China Sea, completely uh, agree with what Danny said. Uh, again, I think our objective here is to support and sustain the rules-based uh, international order, including in East Asia. And I think um, international maritime law is, is one of those issues, and we expect all countries who have an interest in, in uh, stability, freedom of navigation, and freedom of commerce to support that rules-based international order. Just go to the front here, please. Thank you so much uh, for doing this. Atsushi uh, Okudara from Masai Shimbun. Uh, first of all, about TPP, uh, as all of you mentioned, you know, TPP is also one of the uh, top priority of the U.S. Admi administration on, you know, uh, reverence to Asia. So this time, uh, does President Obama encourage uh, President Park to join TPP directly in this summit? Uh, do you have any perspective when uh, it's the right time uh, ROK is going to join uh, this trade agreement? And one more quick thing about uh, Japan ROK relations. As uh, everybody knows, you know, uh, trilateral uh, meeting, Japan China ROK summit uh, is scheduled uh, later this month or uh, early next month. So, this time, uh, what kind of role President Obama uh, to play in this summit, and what kind of message President, President Park and uh, President Obama uh, send to the world uh, to enhance uh, regional cooperation or to improve these two countries' relations? Thanks so much. Well, if I'll begin, um, I won't try to correct some of the statements that are embedded in your question with regard to TPP. But I'd like to make clear that there is now an agreement among 12 member countries in TPP that must go through the respective uh, national processes, uh, in our case through uh, a period of public comment and, and congressional uh, deliberation and a vote. That is what has to happen now. So the understandable focus of our governments and our trade negotiators is having been successful in uh, persuading one another uh, to embrace compromise, now uh, to be successful in persuading our respective legislatures uh, to endorse that. That's the job at hand now. President Park has uh, indicated uh, an interest in TPP, which is understandable for an economy of the uh, scope and modernity as uh, Korea's. And President Obama has welcomed uh, that interest. But uh, the job at hand is uh, completing the processes regarding uh, TPP, uh, the issue of additional negotiating partners uh, lies beyond that. On the subject of the trilateral summit uh, to be held uh, in a few weeks in Seoul, uh, I would say that we welcome that. We see that as an opportunity for enhanced uh, consultation among the three major powers in Northeast Asia. Uh, it's clearly 
an opportunity not only for the three countries to discuss their trilateral free trade agreement, which is an ongoing topic, uh, but also to discuss trilaterally and presumably bilaterally as well uh, their own relations and the uh, strategic environment uh, in the region. I'm sure that uh, the two leaders uh, this week in Washington will uh, discuss the ROK's relationship with both China and Japan. In particular, uh, the U.S. has made clear, and President Obama has uh, gone to great lengths to be supportive of the steady improvement in bilateral relations, not only between the ROK and, and uh, China, which we discussed earlier, but um, importantly between Japan and Korea. Japan and Korea are our two closest allies in uh, Northeast Asia, and their relationship uh, and their ability to cooperate is a strategic priority for the United States. Um, I would just add on, on TPP, um, uh, as Danny said, we very much welcome the uh, interest uh, from the Republic of Korea. And I would point out uh, that the Republic of Korea has bilateral free trade agreements with 10 of the 12 uh, TPP members. So it makes them, uh, it puts them in a very logical <coughs> position uh, going forward. Uh, moreover, uh, we have been in constant consultation with the uh, ROK, the Republic of Korea, on TPP, and we will look forward to continuing those consultations as our processes uh, here in Washington as well as the other uh, TPP member nations' capitals unfolds. Let's go to the middle of that blue scarf, please. Mm -hmm. oh. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mi Kyung Kim with Seoul Shimun Daily, Korea. Um, would you be more specific on what uh, two president discuss uh, in terms of uh, North Korea's f possible further provocations? Will they focus on um, more sanctions against North Korea or returning to the to the dialogue like uh, six party talks? And how will they address the uh, Chinese role to prevent North Korea? Form of the further provocations. Thank you. Why don't I take an initial stand? That's all right. I, I think um, I think both our countries continue to um, watch closely the situation, and I think that we have continued to make clear that we expect uh, and we call on North Korea to live up to its international obligations, both mm -hmm. under the the September 2005 Joint Statement un and under numerous UN Security Council resolutions to uh, live up to those denuclearization uh, commitments, those commitments vis-a-vis -vis, uh, ballistic missile technology, and uh, our expectation that North Korea will avoid any actions that raise tensions or that violate uh, those commitments uh, from the Joint Statement and uh, from various UN Security Council resolutions. So I think that will be uh, one focus uh, of conversation. And uh, the, I think the focus needs to remain on North Korean behavior going forward. And I think that will be where the two presidents uh, focus their discussion. Um, and obviously, as we have seen uh, in the past, North Korea, unfortunately, uh, has not lived up to those obligations. And if we see that uh, situation, we'll have to respond uh, accordingly. You mentioned the, the, the Chinese role. Uh, we've, we've long uh, welcomed and recognized the important role that China plays uh, in the, in the uh, six-party talks process. We've long called uh, on China to use uh, its influence vis-a-vis uh, -vis North Korea to encourage North Korea to return to a path of denuclearization. And I anticipate that that will be a topic of conversation as well. And I can say uh, very candidly, uh, during the recent state visit by President Xi Jinping, this was, of course, a conversation that was discussed both uh, in private and was publicly referred to uh, in the, the joint press conference between President Obama and President Xi uh, in the Rose Garden on September 25th. And um, as you noted, uh, at that time, uh, President Obama made clear what we're focused on, that we're focused on denuclearization, that we will never accept North Korea as a nuclear weapons state. And President Xi stated 
that China remains committed to the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. And so that will be our expectation of China uh, going forward. Mark, yeah, well, let me add that um, the focus of the discussion certainly will cover the range of threats that North Korea poses uh, to the ROK and to uh, the region, uh, the military threats, the uh, other forms of provocation, the nuclear threat and the ballistic missile threat. Um, I'm sure that the leaders will also discuss the abysmal human rights situation in North Korea, which is a matter of uh, grave concern. They will surely discuss uh, inter-Korean relations, mindful of the upcoming uh, long-delayed uh, family reunion uh, visit, uh, which are expected uh, in a l about a week or so. And I suspect they will reaffirm uh, their uh, mutual commitment to advance the goal of peaceful unification. But with respect to sanctions, let's remember that sanctions are a means, not an end. The goal of sanctions is to bring the decision makers in North Korea to the realization that uh, the only viable path forward is the peaceful path of uh, negotiations and compliance with international law and its obligations. And dialogue itself is a means to an end. Uh, we, the United States and the ROK, seek authentic negotiations that can uh, implement the commitments made in the 2005 uh, six-party joint statement. And lastly, apropos of China and China's role, I would add that uh, the recent visit to Pyongyang by the uh, standing committee member of the Chinese Politburo, uh, Liu Yunshan, uh, offered an opportunity for China to speak uh, directly to North Korea's leaders to uh, make its views known. Now, we've heard as Dan mentioned, President Xi Jinping affirmed China's strong commitment to the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula and the avoidance of provocative behavior and uh, the need to uh, honor uh, agreements and international law. Uh, I would certainly hope and presume that that's the consistent message that uh, the Chinese are delivering to all parties, including North Korea. Yeah, I might just add uh, one last uh, point um, to dovetail off of what Dan and Danny have said is, look, we're, we're very aligned on our goals. Uh, uh, authentic and credible negotiation towards denuclearization. Um, and moreover, we're also aligned on the strategy, right, and really a three-pronged strategy. Uh, dialogue, uh, as Danny said, is is uh, paramount, and I think the Obama administration has shown that over the course of the past six years, if there is an interlocutor on the other side of the table, the administration stands ready to engage in principled diplomacy to solve complex problems. In the cases of Iran, Cuba, Burma, bear that out. Uh, however, if the North does not want to come back to the table, uh, like it is at present, we're going to continue to use diplomatic means to, to isolate the North Koreans and to continue to uh, prevent them from effectuating their Byungjin policy. Uh, on the economic side, we'll continue to work and examine ways to impose costs on the nuclear missile programs, both through bilateral and multilateral sanctions. Uh, and finally, we'll, as, as Dan and Danny both mentioned at the outset, uh, continue to work very hard on our deterrence capabilities, uh, be it in missile defense, be it in conventional capabilities on the peninsula. We are bringing uh, the best, most capable platforms uh, to the Korean Peninsula, to the Western Pacific, uh, to ensure that there is a robust deterrence uh, in the peninsula as well as protection of the U.S. homeland. Thank you. Let's go to the back, please. Uh, on the side, please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jason Chang with Yonam News Agency. I'm wondering if there's any possibility of the two leaders discussing 
the issue of that missile defense system as part of yeah, ways to defend against North Korea's ballistic missile threat. And if that issue is not on the agenda this time, wondering when do you think is the best time to dis start discussions on that issue? Thank you. Um, as I've said uh, just last week uh, at a press conference in Seoul, uh, I don't, uh, I think it's highly unlikely that it will come up and I do not believe it will be on the agenda and wouldn't speculate uh, into hypotheticals about when might, may or may not be the best time. Anybody on this side, please? Yeah, my name is Junpei Yoshoka from Japanese Public TV NHK. Can I follow up on the first question from our colleague uh, about ROK-China relationship? Specifically, um, is the United States satisfied with the development of ROK-China relationship showing that President Park going to the military parade and watching PLA's parade? Thank you. Look, it's not lost on anyone that the only f war that the uh, PLA has fought was against the uh, South Koreans. But it's also obvious that the strategic interest of the ROK, and I would argue <coughs> not only the United States, but the, uh, the international community, uh, lies in improved and enhanced coordination uh, between Beijing, Seoul, and other partners with regard to meeting the challenge presented by North Korea's behavior and North Korea's uh, pursuit of a nuclear missile capability. The president of Korea made her own decision, uh, and I think that her uh, ability to engage on substance with President Xi uh, in Beijing uh, afforded her and us uh, a, an opportunity for important uh, consultations. I, I fully agree with that. Just to reiterate what, what we said at the outset, we, we do not see these issues in zero-sum zero -sum black and white terms. Um, I think it's, uh, it's in our collective interest to see every country develop a uh, constructive relationship with China. And, and regarding this uh, particular event, as Danny said, uh, every country made their own sovereign decision about how and whether to be represented uh, at that event, and, and we respect that. Uh, the United States was represented by our very able ambassador in Beijing, Max Baucus. I know another, another, uh, a number of other countries made uh, other decisions. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you very much, for, sir, for doing this. My name is Wada. I'm with Japan's Mainichi newspaper. Uh, you mentioned the importance of uh, cooperation between China and ROK Japan. But there seems to be a new source of potential tension, especially between Japan and China, at, over UNESCO, the recent acceptance of documents related to Nanjing Massacre uh, by UNESCO in its International Memory of World uh, Registration. And the uh, response from Japan, the government of Japan is pretty strong. China doesn't like the reaction, and there seems to be some talks of China and South Korea uh, making some new <laughs> proposal about submitting some documents related to uh, comfort women. Uh, my question is, how worried are you about this issue, the potential of becoming a new source of tension between those three countries? And another question is about your uh, mention of a new frontier issue, one which was uh, cyber cooperation. What kind of cooperation do you want to uh, pursue in this area? Thank you. Could I take the first one? Mm -hmm. uh, on the history issue, I, I would just start by making a very general point that our hope is that uh, all countries in the Asia Pacific could focus on the future, focus on reconciliation, 
could focus on expanding cooperation to, to pursue uh, our mutual interests, peace, prosperity, and stability. Uh, these historical issues that you mentioned uh, are exceptionally complex. Uh, they, they do need to be addressed, but uh, we hope that uh, all of us will keep, that, uh, keep our focus again on the future and reconciliation and cooperation uh, rather than the past. Mm -hmm. And that certainly has been the, ob the objective of, of the United States. And I don't know if you wanted to add to that or if Mark oh. wanted to say something. Um, cyber. Just, cyber? I'll, be, yeah, I'll be very quick on, on uh, cyber. Look, we, we have a, a good deal going on in cyber across a range of agencies between the United States and the Republic of Korea. I think our challenge is to deepen and broaden that cooperation, uh, share best practices, uh, develop expertise, uh, cadres, so on and so forth. Uh, but it's also to coordinate all this, all this activity. Um, you know, we have mechanisms in place on the defense side uh, that help coordinate the myriad uh, uh, and plethora of activity that it goes on in the security relationship. We have the two plus two that coordinates our diplomatic uh, activity. And so perhaps one, one area where we might look to focus on first is to better coordinate all of the activity while we're enhancing, deepening, and broadening it on the technical side as well. I would add, if I could, that since President Park's last visit to the United States, both the Republic of Korea and the United States have been uh, the target of very substantial cyber attacks uh, emanating from North Korea. And I think that the, uh, the urgency and the importance of that coordination uh, is clear to see. I think we'll have to maybe Could I add just one final comment on cyber as well? I, I think there is a real interest as well among uh, all of us in the region uh, in discussing uh, norms and standards of behavior in cyberspace. And I think you'll see the United States together with other partners and friends uh, in the months ahead, in the months ahead uh, making a real push to try to reach agreement on what those acceptable norms of state behavior are uh, in cyberspace. Please, sorry about that. I think we'll have two more questions, then we'll uh, allow the briefers to conclude. Still there, just the front row, please. Thank you. With China Sena News. Um, Ambassador Lambert, um, following up on the military parade, could you, we know there has been concern in Washington about the attendance of President Park to the military parade last month and the picture of her standing next to President Xi and uh, Putin was quite symbolic. Could you um, tell us more about what the negotiation was like between U.S. and Korea at that time? Is uh, President Park's action at odds with uh, U.S. interest? And for Mr. Uh, Krinterbrink, uh, one question. At this timing, right after President Xi just visited the U.S., um, how do you expect the two presidents to um, exchange their China's uh, policy be, uh, to each other? Thank you. Do you want to go first? Or do you want me to go first? Dan, do you want to go, go ahead? Oh, yeah. Um, you know, as, as Danny and Dan have said, they've really answered this question already. Uh, <coughs> this was a sovereign decision by the Republic of Korea. Uh, President Park went to Korea, uh, went to China, and it was clear to us that uh, she made good use of the visit in terms of uh, pushing forward uh, the agenda on North Korea, um, and that's that's a good thing. Uh, we view China, uh, we believe China could and should do more uh, on the North Korea issue, and the president uh, going uh, at this time uh, and engaging the most senior levels of the Chinese government on a very uh, critical uh, issue, uh, such as North Korea, is, is something that we all can uh, be supportive of. And on your question uh, regarding our uh, policies vis-a-vis -vis China, uh, what I would anticipate is that uh, President Obama would have an opportunity to explain to President Park uh, the outcomes of President Xi's state visit here, and as we've stated, uh, publicly many times, uh, we take uh, a, a constructive and balanced approach to our relationship with China. It's an incredibly uh, complex relationship as well. We were pleased during the course of the state visit that we had a chance to focus on the tremendous cooperation that takes place between the United States and China on everything from, from climate change to clean energy to expanding our military to military cooperation and people to people uh, relations. We also broke ground on a whole range of new areas, including development, peacekeeping, 
environmental conservation. Uh, at the same time, uh, I'm confident that the President will be able um, to also say, through this state visit, we demonstrate that our two countries also address uh, very <coughs> candidly, very directly, uh, many of the differences and sources of tension that exist between us. And I think you saw during the state visit by <coughs> President Xi that our two presidents really had very robust, candid discussions on issues like cyber, maritime, and human rights. So uh, if the issue of our approaches to China comes up, I'm sure the president will give that balanced, comprehensive view of our approach, and I'm sure he'll be interested uh, in hearing from, from <coughs> President Park her views on South Korea's relationship with China. But again, to reiterate what we said repeatedly here today, we don't see these issues uh, in zero-sum terms, and we encourage all countries to have a constructive relationship uh, with China. That's certainly been our approach, and we would encourage others to do the same. Let's go to the very back for a final question, please. Uh, thank you very much. I'm Yongini, the correspondent working from the Hungarian newspaper in Seoul. Um, I'd like to ask a sensitive uh, issue. Uh, United States uh, uh, has emphasized that U.S. Korea, U.S. and Korea uh, has been sharing the uh, common value uh, such as democracy or human rights. Uh, but uh, what do you say to people who say that uh, the state control of school textbook uh, is against democracy in Seoul, mm -hmm. in Korea, South Korea. Thank you very much. What I say is that because the Republic of Korea is a democracy, it's for the people of Korea and their representatives to make decisions such as that. We can go. No, no, let's okay, go. We have time for one more. Thank you so much. Uh, Rita Chen from Central News Agency, Taiwan. My question is quite simple. It's regarding the TPP, the not only uh, uh, South Korea, the Taiwan also showing there a lot of interest for joining the second round negotiation. And as the Assistant Secretary said that U.S. welcomes so uh, South Korea's interest. Uh, what kind of the message that you would like to send to Taiwan? And what's the Americans' concern for whether Taiwan can join the second round negotiation? Is the so-called chi China factor play any role in this context. Thank you. My message to Taiwan uh, regarding TPP is this. Keep up the good work. <laughs> <laughs> there has been a significant amount of uh, reform and progress on uh, the economy and on difficult trade issues. There is a lot more uh, that can and should be done. On the very positive side, we are proud to host a growing span of investment from Taiwan, and we're pleased that uh, Taiwan companies uh, see so much value in uh, operating in and investing in the United States. Uh, similarly, our uh, trade relationship is growing and barriers are coming down. These are all good things. Secondly, the, the chapters and the details of uh, the TPP agreement now that the negotiations are done uh, are becoming fully known and offer a template for countries to uh, make progress in their internal reforms by way of liberal, liberalizing, by way of uh, making improvements, whether it's with regard to environment or labor. There's a lot that uh, major economies throughout the Asia-Pacific region, including Taiwan, can do uh, to move into the direction of what would be necessary ultimately to be accepted by all 12 TPP members as a new negotiating partner when uh, the TPP countries uh, ultimately ratify the agreement and then turn to uh, the next step. Do you want to keep going? Or? One more. I think one more. You can take one no, more. Let's take one more. One 
My name is Tong Kim with the Korea Times. Uh, having listened to you out of three, uh, we don't expect anything new in terms of uh, what the two leaders uh, might uh, come to conclusion at the result of their summit Friday regarding what new approaches they might jointly take toward North Korea, which is still most a grievous source of a threat. And without the uh, res resolution of the North Korean issue, I don't think there would be a sustainable or uh, uh, stability, not only on the peninsula, but also in the region as well. Now, uh, question number one, uh, would you, any of you or the administration take any credibility for the fact that the North Koreans for when uh, from their threat to stage a uh, second, I mean, force uh, nuclear test or launching of another missile, long distance missile. They didn't do that. And uh, you said uh, one of the three topic topical areas for the two leaders to discuss about will be number one, alliance that has deterrent uh, the function. And we think uh, we do take credit that that happened because of the strong message that South Korea and the United States issued to North Korea jointly. In that uh, matter, in uh, regard with uh, that uh, matter, whether there has been any uh, channel of communication uh, other than uh, public uh, forums that uh, Washington conveyed any message uh, uh, asking them not to uh, conduct such a provocative actions okay, again this so time. If I understand, um, your two questions are: How concerned are we at the prospect of a North no, Korean no, launcher no, test? No, and do we have? Well, question. let's make it short. So, yeah, last two question is: I understand your positions. You said it's three strong strategy and uh, positions and preconditions of talks, whatever you call it, meaningful and serious, as you, Dan described it today, or others always say credible and authentic, whatever that might be, whether there has been any change, in fact, in the major thrust of the direction toward North Korea. Let me give my colleagues uh, a chance to uh, reply, but to begin by saying, our strategy is to achieve the conditions for the negotiated peaceful denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. That requires an affirmative decision by the leadership in the DPRK to negotiate. What credible means is that we are looking for credible indicators that North Korea has decided to negotiate. Negotiating doesn't mean giving up or surrender. It means engaging seriously uh, in an effort to try to find a way forward and common ground. What we mean by authentic is that the negotiations are focusing on the real issue. And the real issue is uh, North Korea's nuclear program and its violation of UN Security Council uh, resolutions. The strategy which is consistent and which is shared uh, between Washington and Seoul and certainly uh, Tokyo is to bring the North Korean leader to the conclusion that number one, he can obtain the security, the respect, the economic opportunity and the other things that he apparently seeks but only through compliance with North Korea's obligations and through negotiations. Secondly, that the alternative strategy of threatening and blustering, uh, of pursuing uh, nuclear weapons <coughs> and harboring the hope that the international community will support North Korea's economy is a fallacy that will not work. That is one important uh, reason why we continue to strengthen bilateral and multilateral sanctions. The North Koreans have to come face to face with the challenge of apportioning shortfall. Are they going to fund their uh, nuclear program, their missile program, their 
uh, People's Army, their Workers' Party cadre, their light industry, their heavy industry, or buy gold Rolexes and BMWs for uh, party members to buy loyalty. They can't do all of these things. That is one of the important roles that uh, sanctions play. But the strategy ultimately aims at uh, bringing North Korea to the place where it realizes the inescapable truth that only negotiations can uh, get North Korea to uh, a sustainable uh, place. I would just, I would just, let me, I would just add, um, let, let me last, let, uh, I would just add, um, uh, quickly, um, that one, uh, North Korea is more isolated than it's been. The five other parties are more unified than they've been. Two, there are more sanctions, multilateral, unilateral, against the North Koreans. And three, um, there's more platforms and deterrence in the region as a result. Um, the ball's in the North Koreans' court. Uh, the reason it hasn't happened is, unlike Cuba, unlike Iran, unlike Myanmar, uh, who chose to engage with the Obama administration, who offered a diplomatic way forward uh, to engage uh, in uh, principal diplomacy to call solve complex problems. The North Koreans have chosen not to do that th thus far. We're hopeful that they will change their mind. We're hopeful that they will come back to the table. We stand ready. It's precisely why we appointed Sung Kim as our special representative, to have a senior seasoned diplomat ready to engage if and when the North makes a decision to come back to the table. Thank you for joining Thanks. us today. We appreciate your attendance. We appreciate our briefers' uh, valuable time. Thank you. Sirs, we'll